Hello, Michael, and welcome to Conversations on Magic. Hi, everyone. So, Michael, you want to introduce yourself again? Hi, uh, Michael Close here from Canada. Nice to be with you again. Thanks, uh, Guillermo. Always fun. So today, um, I wanted to ask you about something personal to me, which is making magic personal. And everything that I touch, everything that you show me, uh, I think it's the first thing that it happens to me is the next day, on the same day, I take a shower and I try to, I don't try, but it happens to me that uh, things from my life try to, my brain tries to connect things from my life, from my personal life, with whatever effect that what I learned. And I try to fit it in my personal life and bring a personal story. And uh, just an example, um, some, some of the stories that I use is I try to introduce how my parents met each other. And it's actually the real story of their lives and how some stories about my grandmother and some stories about other people. And I know there, are, there is this view within magic where, where the, the effects get uh, richer and more and a different experience because they are personal. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, what well yeah, this is, um, for me, this is an important part of uh, working on any uh, routine, any piece of magic. Uh, one of the things that I like about uh, magic as a hobby and magic as a performance art is it combines uh, two very different things. It because uh, because as magicians, what we're trying to do is to convince the people we're performing for that something that absolutely is not happening is happening. Because we know the method of the trick. We understand uh, that uh, the lady can't actually float up into the air. We know how the mechanisms that make everything work. Uh, but our job is to make it feel as real as possible, to make it make the whole experience feel as real as possible. And that's an intellectual challenge. That's basically uh, my intellect against your intellect and to see if I can do a good enough job uh, to make this trick seem like it's magic and not just a puzzle. Because that's the problem with magic. For many uh, spectators, uh, they look at magic as, well, this is just a puzzle, and the, this guy, the performer, knows how it works, and so my job must be to figure out how it works. And when you um, take away any kind of emotional connection or personalized connection uh, in the trick, then really all that's left is the puzzle. And for a lot of people, they don't like puzzles. Uh, you, know, you, you don't see people hired at restaurants to walk up to a table and hand everybody a Sudoku puzzle and say, hello, I'm the Sudoku guy. Here's your Sudoku puzzle. Work on it until the food shows up and then you leave. A lot of people are just going to throw that away. They don't want to be figuring out puzzles. They want to be relaxing. They want to be enjoying themselves. So uh, the other aspect of magic is that it's a theatrical art form because we perform. We, uh, we are like actors, we are, uh, we're performers, just like a musician is a performer, an actor is a performer, an acrobat is a performer, a juggler is a performer. So what we try to do in the performance is to give some type of uh, emotional hook to find something that the spectators can connect with that makes it more than a puzzle. So that's the first aspect of this. And the second aspect is that people are more interested in people than they are in puzzles. So many magicians feel very uncomfortable, very self-conscious about revealing too much about their personalities. A lot of times people take up magic as a hobby to make up for some uh, deficiency in their personalities. Maybe they're very shy. Maybe they're very awkward. Maybe they don't feel like they're interesting. And by learning magic, they think that makes up for that problem. So they're more than happy to use somebody else's pattern or presentation, whatever you want to say. And this is why uh, when this happens a lot, and it certainly has happened a lot in, in the history of especially, say, close-up magic, um, this is why people 
think that all magicians are the same, that we're all interchangeable because they see us do the same tricks and they hear us say the same things every single time. So my thought has always been whenever uh, I look at a new trick that I'm thinking of adding to my repertoire, the first question I always ask is, what can I say while I'm doing this? What does this trick mean to me? What can I bring to it? How can I relate it to either something in my life or something um, that maybe uh, is a connection with the people watching? And to be honest, if I can't find that, that pathway, if I can't find a way to have something uh, meaningful for me to say, then I never do the trick. Um, I have never performed professionally the cups and balls. I've never performed professionally the linking rings. I've never performed professionally the egg bag. These are classic effects that, uh, you know, very great magicians have done. And I just can't think what to say about them. I mean, there are great routines out there. Uh, you know, Di Vernon had a fantastic linking ring routine. Whit Hayden has an exceptional linking ring routine that fits his personality beautifully. But for me, I don't know what to say when I do it. Same thing with like the egg bag. Uh, Jeff Hobson has a, uh, a, a way of doing the egg bag, of uh, performing the egg bag that fits his stage character perfectly. It's one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen and just fits him so great. I couldn't do it. I couldn't use that pattern. Uh, Johnny Thompson, the same way. Johnny's presentation of the egg bag made perfect sense for Johnny, but it just doesn't fit me. So that's the, that's the first goal. And uh, sometimes that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes it, it takes a long time to get that to work out. But that's always the first thing I suggest. And uh, what has impressed me about uh, the time that you and I have spent together is you're very quick at finding something that relates a trick that has, for example, um, you know, the trick of, of how you're finding your parents is a trick that's basically just a card location. That's really all it is in its initial uh, publication the way that, uh, you know, when Simon Aronson first published that trick, it's just you take a card, you take a card, and I find your two cards. And that's a puzzle. That's nothing more than a puzzle. But you've turned it into something that you can tie into your own life. And now people are interested in how this all turns out. They get emotionally involved in something that without that presentation has no emotional connection whatsoever. So it's, it's a very good thing. You've been doing very good work that way. Thank you, thank you Michael. I, I really like the result of that. And it's in, and I think what it amazes me is exactly what you mentioned because it came very quick after you taught me the, the, the idea behind it. And it's, I do think there is, uh, you mentioned about being a performer and you mentioned several different professions. And one of the things that I did most of my life is being a teacher in, in technology schools and so on. But being, I see being a teacher as a performer also, because I have to have this hook with my students. I have to hook them very quickly. And it's usually emotional hook, something that they have been through in their lives. And then when I get connected with them, then I'm able to, they, they are listening to me, they're paying attention. They, they spend their time and their focus and their energy on whatever I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's something that I brought. And perhaps that's why it gets easier for me to do these connections, I think. Uh, my father was a teacher. He was uh, a professor at uh, Purdue University in Indiana at the campus that's in Indianapolis. And I have spent many hours of my life teaching not only uh, music classes. I was... I taught uh, music theory classes as I was doing my graduate work in Indianapolis, but then also lecturing for magicians. And I've always said that teaching is a performance art because you have this information that you have to impart. And I, I can certainly tell you times when I've sat in lectures of 500 people 
and the chemistry professor came in and took his folder with his notes for that day and blew the dust off of them because it had been a year since he taught the class and he just reads them. And nothing puts you to sleep faster in a 500 person lecture than somebody doing something like that. So there's an energy factor there. There's a way to figure out how you can impart this information so it makes sense, so it's clear to everybody. So there's really, this is why most people during their lifetime, they can only count on maybe the fingers of one hand, the great teachers that they've ever encountered and why they make such an impression on you if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways to approach this. Uh, the problem is it's in terms of adding this emotional hook or adding this interesting story. Um, but what the first thing I try to ask is the question of what does this trick mean to me? What can I possibly relate it to? to something in my life. What what little hook can I, for example, um, uh, there's a, a very famous trick called card warp that was invented by Roy Walton. And that's a trick where one card is folded um, in, in half, you know, uh, this way, and another one is folded in half this way. And when you push this card through the other one, the card turns inside out. And that's usually the way that that trick is presented, that the card is turning inside out. Well, um, there were things about the original Roy Walton handling that bothered me. These are this is a topic for another discussion about finding the things that you know you think need to be fixed, and so the trick is comfortable for you. But instead of talking about a card turning inside out. I can't, I was doing it with a, a card and a dollar bill uh, because there were some moves that were very nice with that. And I thought of the idea of, well, I'm folding this dollar bill into a shape and origami is a hobby of mine. Maybe this is an origami time machine and that the card isn't turning inside out. It is. But what I'm saying it's doing is going backwards in time to when I had it folded with the face out. So I show it faces out first. I fold it so it's backs out. I push it through the bill. And in the time machine, it turns itself faces out again. So it just gives me something to hang this trick on. And because there's an element of truth in it, which is origami's a ho hobby of mine, the words sound very truthful as I, uh, as I say them. So but you have to understand that didn't come to me in an hour. It didn't come to me in a week. I, I may have thought about that for a year between the time I learned the handling and the time I finally hit on what I was going to say as I performed it. I can give you another example of one that took at least 10 years to figure out. Um, I have a trick that's in... Uh, the paradigm shift uh, ebook, I think it might be in the second volume of the paradigm shift ebook, called the IKEA card trick. Do they have IKEA in Brazil? We don't. We okay, don't. well, I, I know what it is. You, yeah. you, I'm sure you know what it is. A Swedish uh, manufacturer of furniture, but the catch is you have to put it together. And uh, the trick is a trick uh, that was invented. Um, Oh, now I'm not going to be able to remember who invented it the first time. And I apologize for that. But I learned it, uh, a variation that Di Vernon came up with. It was called Vernon's Variant. And basically, the trick is this. The spectator has four cards. The magician has four cards. The spectator follows along with these, following the instructions that you do of turning some cards face up, leaving some face down, turning them over, this kind of thing. And when you finish... The magician's cards are all face down, but the spectator has one card that's face up. And that was the way I did the trick for years and years and years. The problem with the trick, of course, is with any trick like that, anytime the spectator fails and you don't, there's the possibility of making the spectator look foolish. And that I don't want to do. So I found uh, in the ensuing years, I mean, I must have read that Vernon trick 
the book was published in 1969. So I've probably known that trick for at least 50 years. Um, and then uh, about 15 years ago or so, maybe 20, maybe 15, I saw uh, Tono Nasaka, the great Japanese magician, do a version of this where at the end of the trick, the card that doesn't turn over properly, the back of that card is a different color or there's something different with it. And then I went, oh, I want to do that version of that. That's really very good. But I still didn't have the hook. And I didn't have the hook until my wife, Lisa, and I had to move several times. We moved from Las Vegas to Indiana. We moved from Indiana to Mississauga, Canada. We moved from Mississauga, Canada to Richmond Hill, Canada. And each time it required taking Ikea furniture and dismantling it and putting it back together again. And if you really want to see if your marriage is solid, do that with your with your partner. And if you are not killing each other by the end of this, then you're a very strong and you're in a very good relationship. And it was after the last time that we had to do this, when we just almost went out of our minds, that I went, oh, that's what this trick could be. It could be me explaining IKEA instructions and the spectator trying to follow along, but always getting it wrong. And each time she got it wrong, I could explain that the reason had nothing to do with her. It was a problem with the way the instructions were laid out. Now, what's great about this is just about everybody has had this experience of trying to put this furniture together and being really frustrated by it. So right off the bat, I think of all the tricks I've ever come up with, this is the one that the spectators relate to instantly. And so now it's not a puzzle. It's it's a part of their life being expressed through a magic trick. It's it's you know the same way that ballet dancers would it might express something through dance. Now we're talking about something that points to a bigger picture than just the puzzle of a card trick. But it, it takes a lot of time to learn to do this. And uh, it really, you know, you should, you need, you have to have a creative mind. You have to be thinking, but the key factor is to think about it. Cause most magicians don't even, don't even try. Most of them don't even try. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I remember about a Brazilian, there's a Brazilian magician that uh, that people taught me about who is called, whose name is Eric Chartiu. I don't know if you heard about him. I or have not. not. And there is, uh, the videos I saw from him is in Portuguese, so it's difficult to share, but I'll share in the links. And he tells, he does something there's one one presentation where he goes to the TV and he has this small scarecrow and the scarecrow is sitting on on his hands like this and he tells the story I don't know if it's uh, two minutes long a story two three minutes long about a little bird who fell in love with the scarecrow but the scarecrow doesn't want to to raise and blah 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 blah, blah and love 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 blah 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 and then the scarecrow rises to meet uh, mm. his love, which is the bird and so on. Yeah. And the, the effect, of course, is the scarecrow moving by itself. Right. And But it's all about the story. It's all about the story and it's a love story. And it's the story about the, the two loves that are impossible, right? It's the bird and the scarecrow, which usually it's the it's the opposites, right? And uh, so I think it, it it's really what you mentioned. It's something that uh, people have well, we don't live in farms nowadays, most people, but we do know about scare crowns. We do know those problems with love, with different people and different situations. Sure. So it's it's very easy to connect and to get involved. And of course, he has one specific persona where he he speaks very slowly. He has this, not like I'm speaking right now, he speaks very slowly and he has full control of his voice, yes. his face and everything. So he's in control of the... Um, the entire situation yeah uh, it, it, it's really something it's something that i like it's something the like. um the spanish school um with tamaris and escanio and um people like um 
Rene Lavand, who was not Spanish, she was Argentinian, I believe, uh, or Argentinian uh, or Chilean, I, I, but from South America, uh, are, are very good at uh, at wrapping these quite dramatic and interesting stories. Uh, part of it, of course, if you're going to go that route, um, you need to be in a situation where people know that they're going to be seeing that kind of show. Sometimes that isn't the best way to do something. If you're at a restaurant and you're, you know, you're filling the time between the order and the food, or if you're working a cocktail party um, where people are not set to experience that kind of theatricality, sometimes it isn't going to work very well. But uh, for those people who can pull it off, I think uh, probably one of the most familiar names uh, is Eugene Berger. And Eugene Berger loved to do these kind of presentations. So when he did Card Warp, his presentation was talking about the Spanish Inquisition. And he turned the whole trick into kind of a form of torture where one playing card is being tortured by being turned inside out as it goes through. So uh, the same thing with his presentation of the gypsy thread which is a trick where you tear a thread or a piece of string into small pieces and then it comes back together. And the story, of course, that he uh, put on that is all about um, Vishnu and uh, uh, Brahma and the creation of the world and all these kinds of things. And it was a beautiful thing when Eugene did it because his voice and the way he looked, it just gave a uh, kind of a gravitas is, I guess, the word that I would say it, you know, it all fit perfectly for his persona. Um, but no matter how you do it, I mean, you it, if you can provide some little hook that makes it a little bit more than a puzzle so that people can find something in it, and especially if it applies to, you know, something about yourself that I think is really good um, because, uh, People want to know about people. They want to know about the people they meet. Uh, most people rarely ever meet a magician in person. They will see them on TV or what have you or on YouTube. But to walk up to a table and to engage a group of people and, and uh, you know, to be found interesting in that thing. And, and one, one thing I say to magicians is if you're not particularly interesting to talk to, when you don't do magic, you're not going to be that interesting to talk to when you do magic. So one of the ways I think that they you can get around that is be a well-rounded human being. Uh, read. Read a lot of different things. Be aware of current events. Know what's going on. So you could carry on a conversation without ever doing a magic trick. I think that's an important part of it. But... Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of people get into magic because they can't do that and they think magic will help them in that situation. Yeah, I, there, there was one person who talked to me, Ben Ludmer, he's a Brazilian magician, and he spoke and he said, well, well one of the things that you have going for you is that you, you talk. You, 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 like, I don't have any problem talking. If I say something wrong, well, that's life and let's move on and try sure. to improve. So talking and expressing myself i have been through so many failures so it's it's okay for me to fail again and then i don't have this fear that a lot of people usually experience. so the the fact that you teach has given you the experience of getting up in front of a group of people and having to relate information and you know one of the things and and i've told my daughter this she performs she's uh acts and sings and for most people uh, you, you know, people who get up on stage, they're worried about screwing up. They're worried about making a mistake. But what you don't understand is that just about everybody in the audience cannot believe that you are standing up and doing that because they would be terrified to do that. So they're really on your side. So, you know, if something goes wrong, if you forget what you were going to say or, or if you make a mistake, um, it's... It's okay. It's really okay. You correct yourself, you move on, life goes on, everything's fine. So, yeah. uh, I typically say for our teachers, because I coordinate the teachers in our school, I typically tell them it's okay to, to say something wrong. I just say, okay, sorry, it wasn't this. Uh, I was wrong. It's this other thing. And I was wrong because of this and that. 
because it humanizes the teacher. Usually when we are teaching, you have, as you said, most teachers are like in the pedestal and some classrooms usually in the past, I don't know, nowadays, they, they actually had a pedestal where the teacher would stand sure. and it was uh, above the level of the uh, line of sight of the students. So it's really like this, this they are, they're like this idol that you have yep. to follow. And so when you bring them to the same level and when you show yourself as a human being who makes mistakes and you're just a normal person, so it's much easier to connect and to, to relate to when we are teaching. And I try to keep that in my entire life. So when I'm doing magic, I try to do the same, I, at least in my situation. And I, like I it's think okay. it's great. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, my friend uh, Bob Farmer, who is a Canadian magician and uh, one of the cleverest, smartest people I've ever met. Uh, I've known him since, well, almost 40 years, I guess. Uh, he said that the sneakiest thing about me is that you never know when the trick starts because I start telling this, telling a story and you get sort of hooked up in the story and then you realize, oh, holy smoke, this is a trick. I should have been paying attention. And by then it's a little bit too late. It's a little bit too late. It's, it's very um, disarming. It, it makes it feel like friends talking rather than um, somebody, you know, standing there and now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but it is a very important aspect of magic, in my opinion. One of the things that is a great benefit to all of magic is that when you take the time to work out a presentation that fits you, now you are unique. Nobody else could do that presentation as well as you could because it's your life. It's your sensibility. It's what you think about this thing. And so it's good for us to be unique, even though we may be doing the same basic effects. You want people to say about you, well, you should see this guy do this thing. It's unbelievable. This guy does this thing so well. You're going to love it. It's funny. It's whatever. But it's uh, because, you know, uh, you would go to a concert to see Prince perform, or let's say to see Elvis perform. But how important is it to see an Elvis impersonator perform? Well, no Elvis impersonator is ever going to gain the fame that Elvis did because Elvis was being Elvis. And anybody else who tries to do that is not going to be Elvis as well as Elvis actually was. So it's always to your benefit to, uh, to be yourself and to shape your magic around you and your personality in your life. Makes sense. You mentioned about the trick before it starts. Uh, it reminds me of my father and there is, well, he actually went to become a priest, Catholic priest before he left the Catholic church. And then later he met my wife, my mother. And so while he was going, there's something called in Portuguese, which is the seminar. I don't know how it's called in English. It's the place they go to study. Oh, the seminary. Study. Yes. Seminary, yes. It, they, it's the school. It's just a traditional school. And then you have some additional years, which is which are equivalent either to theology or philosophy high uh, bachelor degree. So you choose what, at his time. You could choose either theology or philosophy. He chose philosophy. And he was um, it, it was although it was philosophy, it wasn't theology, but it was the same seminar mm -hmm. and the um, of course, it's the Catholic Church 40 years ago, so it, or more, even more, 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago. So it was very traditional and very, uh, the, the image of the Catholic uh, priest mm -hmm. was, or, or the, whoever it was above them, it was a uh, very a strong man and so on. So, and when they went to eat, they all ate at the same time. All the classes would eat at the same time. For Brazil, it's not normal. Perhaps in the US, Canada, other countries, that's normal in schools. In Brazil, it's not that normal that you have like a huge place, everybody eating at the same time. Mm. My father would go there and he was very young and, and he ate some Brazilian beans and some other foods, which uh, kind of upsets your, not your stomach, but your intestines. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of gases. Yes. So then he went back to his classroom and and he couldn't hold it. 
Oh my. And, and you can imagine it's like this teacher who is a priest and he's very strong and yeah. have this very strong image at that time. You still have it uh, in the traditional Catholic church. And my father couldn't hold it and there was this noise. And yes, and then everybody looked and then he pretended it wasn't him. And then the, father, the priest looked at everybody. Who is it? It's nobody. Okay. And then he did it again. And then, he, <laughs> and then everybody was laughing. Everybody, everybody couldn't control but the priest still didn't know how it was, so he kept teaching. And then my father couldn't hold it. And when he did it this third time, it was so strong, so strong, that he actually flew out of his seat. <laughs> he actually flew out of his seat. That's, that's the story of my father in his, in his seminar. And oh. that's what I, what I remembered when you told me that the magic effect begins before you realize it began. Yes. So the story began before you realized it began. And and my father used to tell this story to us when we were kids. And I, I really like it. Because that's the, the reason is because it it's completely relatable. It's it's something of our daily lives. Everybody has has been through it. Right. And and at some point you realize it's it's obvious it's it's a joke it's not real but it doesn't right. matter because you're just you're just having fun with it and that's, that's it. good and it, of course it's it's a childish story but uh i think the idea is there the concept yeah. is there. absolutely yeah absolutely okay so michael i think that's it for today and um, thank Great. you very much oh very welcome let's do it I again down, yes i wrote down some of the names you mentioned i'll i'll find some links and, and share them with Great. Thank All you right. very See you much. Next time. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.